All right. Welcome to Bite Me. This is season one, episode 38, The Truth About Manipulative Assholes with Patty the Panda. I've always wondered what runs through the mind of a narcissist. I have three ex-husbands, all completely entitled dicks, which now, years later, I've come to realize their attitudes were the result of some sort of unresolved childhood trauma, and that had nothing to do with me. Strangely, I still find the psych of the narcissistic mind fascinating. For years, I've analyzed the behavior, studied it, exposed it. I even managed to build an entire online following out of it. Yet I can never truly grasp what exactly makes these individuals believe their treatment of others is in any way justified or okay. I know my viewers feel the same. And to them, I say, get ready for this episode because today I have a special treat for everyone. A new friend and fellow TikToker has graciously volunteered to let us dissect his brain as a former narcissist. I give you all the one, the only, the completely lovable, but always brutally honest, Patty the Panda. Patty, will you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi, and thanks so much for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. I'm a first time caller, big time uh, follower. I appreciate it. Um, but I'm Patty the Panda. Obviously, most people would know me on, on TikTok. That's my primary platform. I'm not really a social media guy beyond that. But I do I do have a YouTube channel there, Patty the Panda as well. And I guess my, my content is primarily US politics, culture, a little bit of Ireland, a little, you know, travel kind of tourism kind of bit there as well. And a little comedy. It, yeah, a little bit of comedy, and obviously you did mention I'm very adorable, uh, or lovable, rather. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, a cheeky, chappy kind of... Um, Who's and, a panda for sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't want to hug a panda? True story, true story, yeah. Unless that panda is holding a giant spiked bat, which may have been you a few years ago, right? Yeah, I was certainly, yeah, very different person. Um, you know, when, when I talk about who I used to be and um, people are act, are genuinely shocked because I, I am a very kind of nice guy. You know, I, I'm a hugger by nature um, and I, and I, you know, very kind of easy to talk to. And I'm, you know, I try to feed the empathy side of me now, but certainly for, you know, the bones of 20 years, I, I was an absolute bastard of a person who literally every single interaction that I had in my entire life was, um, was something that would ultimately benefit me either short term or long term. Um, so if you can imagine that side of me where I'm literally manipulating everything like a chess game from the age of, you know, 10 years old onwards, um, that's who I used to be. And that's who I try not to be on a daily basis. You mentioned there that I was a former narcissist. I'm still a narcissist. I just um, work on the other parts of my personality instead. And I don't feed that part of me as much. Um, because once you have an awareness, things change. And we'll get into that, I'm sure. I think that our um, many of my viewers and you, your viewers would be very surprised to learn these things about you. So that brings us actually to our first question. You used to be an addict, and by your own admission, as you just said, a manipulative asshole. Your words, not mine. <laughs> so just tell us the story and don't hold back. Yeah, and again... So, so once an addict, you're always an addict. So, um, so at any point I could pick up a drink again and, you know, I'd be back exactly where I was, you know, so I have to work in a, on a daily basis. So you're never, it's a lifelong disease. You're never free from it. It's always there. But again, it's you, you, you can make a choice through your self-efficacy to either, you know, feed that side of you or starve it. And, and I'm certainly starving it for, for a long time. So, um, I suppose I, I had my first ever drink when I was 12 years old. Um, there was a bit of a street party. There was the local sports team had won an event. And um, I had, you know, my upbringing was a, a, a traumatic one and a problematic one. I would have had mental health issues early on in life, but I grew up in a big family with I had eight siblings, four brothers and four sisters in relative poverty. So things were never quite happy in our household and I just remember that party and seeing people really happy in the street and I made that correlation between happiness and drinking and the second I made that my first coping mechanism was born um, so I started drinking then um, and I remember the euphoria euphoria after a couple of drinks I was like okay I'm a different person you know I'm a man about town and quite happy quite superman you know, powers yeah it was really yeah. kind of my ego was like oh, really out there so i was like okay well this is something that i can certainly tr keep doing and over over the next six to eight years you know binge drinking at the weekends and 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 dealing with any kind of 
emotional scenario or ongoing issue in my life was like I can forget about it until the weekend and then I'll drink it away and then I'll An forget escape. about it until the weekend and I'll, I'll drink it away and in addiction the drinking is always just a symptom of, of something else you know right. so you know in, in, in my family household my dad would have been very physically abusive you know I would have been hospitalized multiple times you know from the age of maybe two right up until the age of 14 when I was like big enough to to not need to go to the hospital anymore my mom was just as bad you know she she used um, a golf club on us you know when she lost her temper um we were very very poor um you know so and obviously that had a knock-on effect then in school because you're wearing the same clothes for weeks on end and you know there was hygiene issues and so there's bullying and everything that goes along with that and then you know there's lots of other types of, of things going on you know you know rows with the neighbors and you know my my parents were rather narcissistic themselves you know so um yeah. and contr very controlling so you know you put all of that into a pressure cooker melting pot and you know you know something's about uh, going to break and unfortunately and um, the trauma triggered you know the coping mechanisms that i had and uh, which were primarily one wear a mask and pretend everything is okay uh, two try to be the best version of what everybody else wanted me to be and three, drinking as much as I could to, to numb whatever the hell was going on. Um, and those three things shaped the next 20 years of my life. So when we talk about, like, if I were to ask you why you were the way you were an addiction and childhood trauma and insecurities and what drove that, it's all of that basically in a nutshell. How did your mind work? Yeah, so... So in terms of narcissism and in terms of the alcoholism, um, so because of that trauma, you're essentially emotionally stunted. You know, we, you know, even now, if you were to ask me my emotional age, I'm seven. And, yeah. and whenever I talk to people in similar scenarios, I ask, okay, think back to when you were a child, think about one memory, be it good or bad. How old were you? Typically it's a bad memory. And the, the age that they typically are then is the age that they are emotionally right now. And the same coping mechanisms we had at seven, like for me, are the same ones that I that initially kick in today at 37 on Monday. Um, so we're emotionally stunted. So we don't have that same empathy. And that's a key word, empathy, that other people have. And there's a thing called ocean, which is openness, conscientiousness, empathy, agreeableness, and narcissism neuroses. And we all have ocean within our psyche and within our personality, but we have different levels of each of those. But unfortunately for myself, I had I was 80% N and the 20% was, was spread out amongst the others. But people like yourself would be very high on empathy and agreeableness and um, maybe cer certainly agreeableness earlier on in your life. Um, but now you're much more rounded across all five of the letters. And just to pause real quick so that people know what we're talking about, when, when Patty says people like myself, he's talking about people like me and my followers who have been victims of narcissists. Yes, you yeah, are able yeah. to target us. Yeah, so you're looking at the mindset then of, so I would look at you and I would see a set of circumstances that would benefit me in some way, shape or form. So the very second I would say hello to you, I already have a, an immediate goal, a, a medium goal, and then a long-term goal. And Straight. this is all things you're already thinking in your head. Immediately. While I'm just shaking your hand thinking, hey, I'm just meeting this dude. And I'm like, okay, how quick can I move in with this person? That's so <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not even like, uh, and, and I told you, I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Immediately, I'm looking at how can this interaction benefit me? I mean, that blows my mind because I thought this in my brain. I'm like, my and people have told me that guy knew what he was doing from the second he did it to you. And in my mind, I can't wrap my head around it because I'm like, no one thinks like that. But you're saying they think like that. No, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not even saying that they think like that. I'm saying that I know that we, th we think like that because that's exactly how I thought all that's of the crazy. time. And, you know, with the addiction coupled in, you would have been what I would have called a hostage. So you would okay. have been someone that I could have used as a crutch to pretend that my life was perfectly fine and normal so that I wouldn't be exposed for the narcissist that I was or the alcoholic that I was. I'm so just you, a tool. You would be my mask, my beard, you know, my crutch in order to facilitate that. But 
from the very second I say hello to you, I know because I've started everything off with a lie and a facade and a character, I know that it's only a matter of time before it blows up in my face. And my whole job from that point to end point is to elongate and prolong the scenario and make you feel like you can't get rid of me and keep up the pretense until it finally happens. And then when it finally happens, I've already started my manipulation and narcissism with my next victim. How do you know what victim to pick? Um, people are- She's alone people, at the bar, she's looking um, at you, or yeah, there, so or he, or I, I don't know what your preference is, I guess. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm heterosexual, and, you know, so it would be women, but you know, we live in a different world now where 90% of our romantic interactions are, are online. And so that's, you know, that's, you know, plenty of fish, for example, you can be talking to 10 or 15 different people at any so given time. So you research it maybe a little? And then over the course of maybe a conversation, you know, okay, well, I can, okay, well, that's, that's, a, that's a very viable option. That's a, Oh that's my a, God. It's <laughs> crazy. It's like you're fishing. It's yeah. like you are picking up like a selection of things in a market. Yeah. And, and one thing I want to put it across, like, and, you know, and again, you know, so I'm being very honest here. So I hope, yes, I hope yes. there's no blowback here. But in terms of that, I wanted to be very clear that I have selected you. I have chosen you and I have deliberately gone after you in that way, rather than it happening over time. So I will identify, and sorry, when I say now, it's like in the past, I would have identified, yeah. okay, who you are, what you're about, your financial status, your living status, if you have kids or not. Um, and this is just in the first couple of questions, then I'd be able to say what's important to you. And then I can push that character, that narrative to you. We need to trigger warning this episode. Yeah. I'm freaking out in my chair right now. Yeah. I told you oh earlier. I told you we should have warned the viewers. Yeah. Okay, well, it's okay. It's okay. We're here now. Okay, um, okay so, so you're assessing so the situation of the individual. So then I build the character that you need me to be from, from what the, the fuck? Yeah. What the fuck? Because because at the end of the day, you're a vessel. So I will want accommodation from you or um, you know, a social, you know, um uh prop or housing or you know financial aid. Something you're getting something, something in from. exchange. So I need to give you what you are looking for, and I will get all of that in exchange. And part of that is then anchoring myself then into you so that in two months time or in six months time or a year time, when you're like, I just need to be patient. He's going through a tough time and he'll go back to the way it was at the start when he was really happy and everything will be good. And I'm here to tell you that that's never going to happen because I was never that person at the start. I but here's the thing. No one taught you this. So how do you know how to do all this? Well, you learn how to manipulate certain situations from a very early age. So like at the age of 10, you know, my parents would have been very manipulative as well. So I would have picked up things from them. Some learned behavior. I would, have, I would have seen, you know, and read situations. I can read people really, really well. So you can you can use that as leverage then as well. And again, you know, every every interaction, you're looking for instances where, okay, I can use that later on. Okay, in two weeks, I can use that. You're filing it away in your brain. Absolutely. Can I use that now? No, no, no. Hold off. If you if you want, you can use that in two weeks' time, and it'll be a much bigger payout. Um, yeah. This is crazy. This is so, actually a huge, it's very triggering, that's true, but it's actually a, a huge gift you're giving some of us right now. So because you, you're providing us with, um, like, we have always thought we're crazy. You're uh, providing us with reassurance that like, no, we're not crazy. This is actually going on. So I will say that one of the reasons why you would be targeted is because you'd be identified as having some esteem issues and some self-worth um, issues. And, and we can play on that because it's easier than, it's easier to tackle somebody like that than somebody who's, you know, a bit of an arsehole themselves you know you know we we'd never go after a character that would be as strong as our own it's always somebody who we would seem see as much more empathetic than than we would be and um, and the thing the thing about it is i will never care what what you're thinking or how you're feeling i will only ever care how i'm feeling and how the scenario is affecting me and if your bad mood or your emotional state is making things more difficult for me 
I will apologize and kiss ass. But if it doesn't, I'll say, well, it's your problem. You're crazy and you need to make it up to me. Wow. I mean, like you are describing my ex-husband. You know, it's hard because the my second ex-husband he's only a narcissist because he's an addict there's a little bit more to that like he wasn't a narcissist until he became an addict and even then it was all about drugs because there's different types of narcissists you know but my first and specifically my third husband very very just um just pure evil like he killed my dog and like the things that you're saying very just very system i mean it was a whole process with him and you are describing that to a t so, so an example I like to use is, so I'm, I was always a big drinker and I, I, and I recognized that I was drinking alcoholically when I was, when I was 22. Okay. But if I wanted, so I would start a fight with you tonight. Yeah. If I, if I wanted to go out with the lads in two weeks time. So I would literally start it then in order to build it up so that I would be justified to go on a weekend long bender. With this my is like chess yeah it's too much didn't that become too much like yeah. how do you keep track of it all well well that's part of the controlling nature so you need to constantly protect the mask that you're wearing and you need to make sure that you're not exposed at any given time so you're constantly worried about what you've told x y and z and making sure that x y and z are not talking to a b and c because you've told them something different so you try to control everything and you shrink the net which means that I'm preventing you from talking to your friends, your family, your loved ones, your work colleagues, um, to make sure that they don't have an impact on your thinking that makes me look bad in any way, shape, or form. You're playing the long game. Very so, much patience. A narcissist has a lot of patience for the process, I feel. Yeah, well, because you're, you're mapping it out, like you said, it's a bit like chess, except you're playing... 20 different games of chess at this uh, simultaneously fuck that um, that's crazy you know and then at the start you know at the start things are so easy because you know i'll identify let's say you're a single mom you're in your 30s and um, you know you had a really bad breakup with, with a guy you've been single for three years etc and i'll go okay well they need somebody who has a job so i'll pretend to have a job they need somebody to who you know has a maturity about them but you know, is big into their family because family is born. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my siblings and whatnot. Um, but I'm going to try and meet your kid as soon as possible to create a bond there. Because and, and, and you guys don't care about the kid either is the thing. Don't, don't didn't That's care in any way, shape, or form. Awful. Create a bond with the kid to make it more difficult for the mom to get rid of me. Because, hey, I mean, how can you break up with me? We just announced after one week that we're in a relationship on Facebook. I met your kid last week. He loves me. You know, how can you No, give it some time and let's see what happens. You know, I am dying right now. Dying. And I'm sure people listening are dying too. That's this is, I can't believe that this is like, Oh my God, this is actually how it works. Like you talk about it. Like this was something you could just do any time like i went through it but you have probably done this to several people which actually brings us to our next inquiry which is at your lowest point what's the worst we don't even know, need to go to the lowest point just in your mind what's the worst thing you have done to somebody that you aren't proud of yeah i mean i mean there's so much that i've done as an addict you know so when i mean we're talking about bonds with kids and stuff so you've broken hearts of children yeah of women so so lots of those things so there's different degrees so you will always have maybe a few different scenarios on the go at any given time and not just the one so if let's say you and i are are doing our little um chess game i'll have three or four different chess games you know starting to develop in the background as well um but that whole hostage thing taking a hostage you know, there was one one girl that I that I really hurt, that I really hurt. And uh, we were together for about a year. I knew from the second we got together that it was going to end at some point. It was just a case of when. Um, and she really thought that it was it was it. Uh, uh, you know, that that she had met the person for her. And I really hurt her. Really, really, really hurt her. 
Um, and that's, so I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of criminal stuff and I've done a lot of other stuff, but um, that's, that's one of my biggest regrets that I hurt her in the way that, in the way that I did, because. Um, You're saying she really thought there was going to be a lifetime with you and you had no intention of that. Yeah, and I never, from the very, it never developed more parts, just a, a, a crutch for me ever. How long um, did that go on? So that was a year and um, that relationship. Um, but, you know, so I, I've been in three long-term relationships in my life and then just, you know, casual stuff, but it's the casual stuff where you can do, you know, a lot of damage in a very quick period of time. Um, but, but, I, uh, but I also want to just, you know, just mention that, you know, narcissistic personality disorder is a psychological condition and yeah. it's down to trauma. Alcoholism is, is a disease. Um, so I never say that these things are, you know, I never blame that stuff for my, my behavior and my actions. But certainly once, once I became aware of that part of me, um, everything changed from that moment onwards. So everything, and you, you, in, the, in the pre-interview, I guess you mentioned, you know, there's certainly remorse there. Like I, I hate that person. I hate that version of myself who, who is still even today capable of doing those things if he wanted to I hate that person myself so i work so hard every single day to make sure that that person doesn't exist anymore as much as i can he will always be there but i do my best every day to make sure that that doesn't happen and part of that is having tough conversations like this with you so that people you know women out there genuinely think that for years that they're crazy they're being gaslit on a constant basis that it was them it was their fault that they're the reason why they're not happily married with kids now they're the reason why they don't no longer talk to their mom or their sisters or why they have to move house to a different part of the country or why they you know change jobs that it's their fault and it's important it's only you were only a prop in a game that the narcissist was playing and and it's his fault or her fault whoever because women are, can be narcissistic as well it's a hundred percent their fault it was a hundred percent intended and it was just a game from them and they're very unhealthy people mentally you're saying they're just sick very yeah and some people who have those narcissistic tendencies can change with self-awareness but the vast majority don't care. There's never that moment of clarity of awareness. They'll carry on doing it for the rest of their lives without, without, without remorse, without consequence, because again, it's never about you. It's always about how things have impact them and how well they can look to the outside world. And once they start looking bad, they literally just pick up sticks and move on to the next town or next uh, scenario and block out everything that happened prior to that and just do the same thing over and over again. On that note, we're gonna take a quick break because I know that my viewers need it. We'll be right back with Bite Me. Hey guys, welcome back to Bite Me. We're here with Patty the Panda. So when we left, we were talking about um, lowest points and how, we, how the narcissist hurts people and what that looks like. What, Patty, would you say um, changed you or how have you atoned for these things? Yeah, so so again, so my narcissism and my addiction are, are always running parallel to each other, always. So narcissism is almost like an addiction in and of itself. But so my alcoholism is what kind of started to to, to break me as a as a person, um, and that actually started with panic attacks. So I had my first panic attack when I was thirty one years of age, um, and I was like, I had no idea what had happened, what was happening. I ended up in a hospital. Um, and they were like, oh, you just had a panic attack. And I was like, what? You know, and, and that started, you know, a cycle of, you know, co you know, con continuous anxiety and panic and whatnot. And I was like, hang on, will I deal with stress like a, like a fucking champion? Because I have all of these chess games going on all of the time and I'm able to manage all of it. So what, are you, what the hell are you talking about? But that was, that was the first sign of, okay, my psyche is starting to break here. Um, and over the next four years, um, no, sorry, over the next three years, um, 
my mental health deteriorated and deteriorated. My depression got worse. Um, yeah, my alcoholism got worse and worse and worse. And, you know, I started going from drinking at a, on a weekend basis to drinking every single day to drinking every single morning to, you know, to the extent I was drinking a gallon of whiskey every day of my entire life and hoping that, you know, when I pass out that I would never wake up again, you know. So it got to the point where my mental health had suffered so much that, you know, I was trying to, you know, on trigger warning here uh, to, to take my own life and actively trying to overdose. You know, I ended up homeless for a while. You know, I, uh, you know, I did some, some criminal acts when I was homeless and um, the things got pr- very, very low. And the rationale then moved from, you know, focusing on being a narcissist and, and taking trophies and, and taking hostages to just trying to say, well, you know, it's perfectly normal that you're in this spiral because, you know, the stuff that's happened to you in your life, you know, what, what does anybody expect? But always, I was always afraid of what other people would think of me because I was, you know, circling the drain. And you mentioned uh, something about a zebra on break. Yeah, that, well, that's, that, that comes after I got sober. Um, um, and that's just simply to do with my relationship with my dad, because a lot of this comes down to, you know, our relationships with our parents, you know, and the attachment right. styles that we have because of our, the parenting that we had and the, 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 the adult child dynamic that we had. On, on New Year's Eve in 2017, I, I took an overdose along with uh, copious amounts of alcohol and, and tried to end my life for the first- Overdose of heroin. No, um, it, was, it, was, it was a multitude of like um, uh, benzos, like Xanax and, and other type things. You know, I think there was about 120 tablets or something in total. And um, plus uh, three liters of whiskey, and yeah, just put it all down, and um, woke, I, you know, hoping that I would that I would die. Uh, woke up the following day on New Year's Day, two thousand and eighteen. It was just the weirdest thing. It was like for the first time in years, I was like, okay, I'm glad I woke up today, and um, I was like, okay, and I was like in a pool of my own excrement, and there was vomit everywhere, and. And uh, I was like, okay, well, things things have just got to change. And, you know, in terms of alcoholism, you either have to lose everything or find something or find a reason. to. Uh, and I had already lost everything. By my own design, I'd lost everything. Um, but I, in that moment, it was like, okay, well, I was, I was happy I woke up that day. Um, made a call. And two days later, I was in a rehab program. I was there for three months and sobered, sobered up. Um, and I've been sober ever since. My sober date is the 1st of January, 2018. And every single day since that day, I've been working on myself every day, continuously, to make sure that I don't do anything that I was doing when I was drinking, when I was in active addiction, when I was in active narcissistic behavior. So I, as not to repeat the behavior. Because, like I mentioned in the first, in part one, I'm so ashamed of that behavior now so ashamed and and we come back to ocean i mentioned it at the start openness conscientiousness empathy agreeableness and neuroses narcissism i now actively every day work on o c e and a to make sure that i'm very balanced and every single person has narcissistic tendencies within them but they just not to feed that part of them and they focus on the rest of their, their other personality traits and i every day work on the other my personality traits and most people who know me now would think that I'm very empathetic and I and I and I genuinely believe that I am empathetic now because I now have an awareness of the shit bag that I fucking was how it impacted other people and and I just really don't want to ever replicate that behavior ever again so when uh, we talk about your rehabilitation and awareness of the narcissistic behaviors and the, all the things that come with that Obviously, some maybe a narcissist out there is listening. Maybe they're not. But a lot of the time, I think you would agree you can't advise a narcissist to do anything. They're going to do what they want. But for people who are dealing with somebody who is like this, what advice would you give that person? So you can't. So again, yeah, you can't tell a narcissist you're a narcissist. It would just get to their defenses up and they'll go on the attack and they will convince you that you're the problem instead of accepting that they're the problem. 
they'll never they'll never do it unless they're ready to change it will never happen it's the same with addiction an addict will never change unless they're ready to change and i would i would put this forward the only person anyone can change is themselves so women in particular have this thing that they think that they can fix the men in their lives it's nurturers it will never happen the only person who can change the man that you want to change is that man himself and the vast majority of times he will never care enough to do so ever and i and i am underlining that point he will never do it unless it's his idea and he wants to do it and in order for him to get to that point he has to let you know the person you think I am is not who I am. He has to let the world know the person who you think I am is not who I am. I'm actually this person. And they've already spent their entire life making sure that nobody sees that side of them. So Because why the you- women and the men or whoever is listening to this who's dealing with a narcissist, they're going to say to themselves, well, Patty's here doing it, so maybe they can do it. So, but you're so- the exception to the rule. I am the exception to that rule. And some people do change, Absolutely. Once people have the self-awareness to recognize, you know what, that person is really hurting and I'm responsible for that. And I don't want that to happen anymore. And I want to stop the stress, like waking up in the morning and having this avalanche of, uh, like we go back to the analogy of chess, you know, the chess moves, you know, who did I say that to? Who did I say this to? And I have a motto now, um, if you don't lie, you have nothing to remember. Every day, I say that same thing. So I just tell the truth regardless. Yeah. And even if it makes me look horrific, I'm having this interview with you. People will think all kinds of stuff. It doesn't, it. Bother, it doesn't bother me because I'm being honest. I'm being genuine. And in the same way as I have absolute shame for who I was, I'm very proud of who I am now. So, and that's a different- It's your shit. You may as well own it. Yeah. It's there, you know? But- so here's what I would say to people. If it, if it seems too good to be true at the beginning, that's a red flag. And it might seem like, no, no, I just, I'm just lucky. No, no, it's a red flag because, <laughs> because they're deliberately making themselves be that wonderful person you've always been looking for because that's who you've described to them that you want, that you need. You and they're told being them. That person. You've told them. You don't they remember. Asked. They just put the puzzle together. And yeah. people are very simple creatures. People are simple creatures. Everybody wants happiness. They want, you know, somebody that they can bring home to their family. They want somebody who they can go on trips with. They want somebody who their kids can get on with or who they want to have kids with, etc. They want their own home. They want their picket fence. You know, things are, people are the very- The mirage, simple. the fantasy. So if it's too good to be true, true, that's a red flag. Like the amount of times that I've been told that sentence, like, why are you single? How, like, you're like the perfect guy. Like, how are you? And I mentioned during the break, like, I would simply reply, well, I was clearly just waiting for you to come along. And I'm so glad that you are. And thank you for taking a chance on me because, you know, I have some skeletons in my closet and one day we'll talk about them. Like a script in Love Actually. That's, and it's, it's, you mentioned a script. Like, it really is, you know, because trial and error you know exactly what works and exactly what doesn't work you know um yeah it's a whole thing that's some heavy stuff and i definitely what i just i just wanted to say like in terms of you know people thinking oh if i'm just patient they'll things will settle down and things will go back to the way they were at the beginning i can't reiterate this enough they will never go back to how they were at the beginning because they, it, it didn't exist. It was a facade. It was an act. That person never exists. If somebody after six months is all of a sudden being a bit of an arsehole, they're being a bit controlling, their, their temper is raised, it means that the game is getting to them and they're, they're struggling to, to juggle all the pieces. Um, they don't like the fact that your friends are kind of saying bad things about them or, or trying to convince you of X, Y, and Z. And... Um, that's who they are. That yeah. person, is who they, are. they were never that charming person at the beginning. They're just really good at acting. You're in love with a fantasy. And a fantasy that you've created in your head, that you put yeah. out there. And that's, and that sounds, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that, that it's such a cunty thing to, to do, to, to target someone, to expose that side of them, to take 
advantage of their vulnerability to take their mindset away from them but hurt people know, hurt people hurt people but and never given a crap because if but it doesn't you're hurt me, say, say that again you're hurt so you hurt people yeah that's why the narcissist does it but narcissists most of the time are not aware that they're hurting they're not aware that the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because they had some trauma in their life that they never dealt with it they never dealt with it in any way and they're emotionally stunted as a result of it you know yeah. and, and a lot of my trauma comes down to my dad who just never liked me as a person very physically abusive towards me and i kind of had a realization in my sobriety you know we can expect people to be like our parents in particular to be thoroughbred horses you know the best of the best you know because we think everybody else's parents are thoroughbred horses and we want our parents to be like that the reality is our parents are fucking zebras they're always they always have been zebras they always will be zebras we can want them to be thoroughbred horses all we want but they're zebras so the only person who can change our expectation of the zebra is us we can change our expectation of what we want from them so all of a sudden the thoroughbred horse goes away and we don't need the thoroughbred horse and we recognize somebody as a zebra and it just simplifies everything calms everything down narcissists are zebras our parents are zebras once we get away from what we expect other people to be you know things get very very simple so that was a that was a life-changing kind of realization for me i have no relationship with my dad at all now because i cut that toxic person out of my life um and my life changed as a result significantly the key to happiness is low expectations or to not have them at all, perhaps. It's like water's wet, grass is green, sky is blue, and you are who you are. Well, expectations in terms of love and family and happiness and we're not is really just us measuring ourselves against other people's stuff or what we think other people have. Comparing. If we can strip, we can strip all of that away, we find a happiness in the very simple things. And it's then that you're truly happy and you don't give a crap about anything else. I want to commend you on your ability to self-reflect and that you do feel shame and remorse for the things that you have done. And I do realize that you're the exception of the rule and that a lot of people at home who are dealing with narcissists are not going to have that same experience and they need to know that, have, that they're not going to have that same experience. I do believe, though, there is great um, bravery in you coming on here and laying your shit out and admitting it for us. So I want to thank you for that. But on a lighter note, outside of the shit of it, Ooh. because you because you live in Ireland and because you've had an out al an alcohol addiction, you have to tell us before so we don't leave all just feeling just like, oh, that's so heavy. Like tell us your funniest or worst ever, or like what's the craziest bar story or drunk story that you have? Most embarrassing. Oh. <laughs> the most, the, the most embarrassing. Um, um, I'm not sure if I have an embarrassing story. Like I, I worked for a software company once upon a time, and I was dealing with the American market. So the whole office would leave at 5 p.m. every day, and I, I stayed until 10, like or 11, because you know the U.S. market is like five hours behind. So I'd be in the office completely by myself for five hours, and I'd start drinking. Um, but like one night in particular, I just, I got so drunk that I thought I was at home. Oh I, my God. <laughs> and I just, and I just got ready on my desk, which is an open plan area and just lay down in my boxer shorts and my t-shirt thinking I was completely at home and I didn't wake up until everybody was coming in in the morning. What and, the you know, and Brita, Brita, the poor woman who's the office manager was just like, what are, what are you doing? Like, just, and I was like, oh, I just, oh, I was working so late, like, and but there was you know, my empty bottles were there, the glasses. Yeah. And stuff were there. So that's pretty embarrassing. Like that's, I mean, that, I mean, I lost my job eventually because of that kind of behavior. But like, I, I, but at the time, like, I was like, well, my employers are absolute assholes. How dare they treat me so badly? Right. right. You know, like all I did was fall asleep in the office, drunk, drunk in my fucking <laughs> pants. In an office <laughs> environment, there was like. 32 women and two dudes you know like yeah, yeah that was perfectly normal and natural how God. how dare they <laughs> how dare the people fire me what the hell is their problem <laughs> no well, oh, absolutely there you 
There you have it, folks. You can't change a narcissist. And also don't fall asleep at your work with your boxer shorts on with alcohol all around you thinking that you're at home. Um, For more information on narcissistic behavior, you can visit psychologytoday.com and check out the article, Understanding the Narcissistic Mind. And for a general guide to the different types of narcissists, you can go to mindbodygreen.com and check out eight types of narcissists and how to distinguish them. Patty, I want to thank you for being here with us today. And do you have anything you want to plug? Yeah, so obviously um, my channel is Paddy the Panda and I and I do a lot of charity work now and charity walking. So I'm doing a charity walk on the 8th. It's actually my birthday on Monday. So to coincide with that, I'm doing a walk for Pieta House, which is a suicide prevention and awareness charity. And I'm doing a 5K walk until the sun rises um, here in Ireland. So I'm going to be taking videos and pictures and whatnot. There's a link in my bio for the GoFundMe. Um, and if anybody can help out, that'd be great. Um, but apart from that, listen, I just really want thank you for the opportunity i appreciate that that got really heavy really serious and triggering i'm sure for a lot of people but um things only ever change when people have proper honest conversations like this one um and it's only true conversations like this that people can have the awareness to to um to call people on their crap or or to realize hey i'm worth more than the situation i'm currently in Um, and maybe this has helped some people like that I hope so too. Well, there you have it, guys. An honest conversation with Patty the Panda and the Truthful Groomer. Go ahead and check out the website, Insta, and Twitter, and I'll see you guys next time.